Awesome. Joseph Nelson from Robofill here. Really excited to welcome Brandon Gillis from Luxonis. Um, today we're going to be talking about embedded AI and the success that Brandon has had with the launch of his recent device. Thanks so much yeah. for, uh, for joining us today. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks for having me. It's, it's great to have this platform to discuss our platform. <laughs> cool. So, Brandon, you and I actually um, got connected back earlier this spring before your giant Kickstarter success. And right. that was when um, you introduced me to the concept of, of spatial AI. And I actually think the journey of how you got into it uh, related to safety and bicycle transportation is pretty interesting. So it'd be great to hear about like how you found your way into the embedded and on-device spatial AI creations. Yeah, absolutely. So um, actually, I left my job because a mentor of mine left. Well, like times were great. And I love that job, best job of my life. And uh, I was like, what's happening? And he's like, well, this whole AI thing is is going to be the biggest opportunity in my career. I need to go 100% into it. And I knew nothing about AI at the time. Like the last I had talked to someone about AI was like 2004. And it was my college roommate doing Lisp and him just describing how useless it was. So I started Googling and I was like, holy cow, like starting in 2012, this just exploded. Deep learning, machine learning, all the capabilities, like easy, like you don't have to, you don't have to come up with all these, all these algorithms. Um, you know, you can teach a machine, you can train a machine, it can learn, you know, how to even drive, right? Um, and so it's the advent of kind of like uh, what some researchers did with like just recording sensor data off of a car in 2012. And then all of a sudden it could drive around a neighborhood, right? With video and sensor data. And it's crazy to me. Um, so I... I studied that for like a year um, and I eventually left my job to uh, pursue machine learning uh, full time. Um, and in that time, I kind of realized, wow, I, I was really behind the times. Uh, you know, it was 2012, 2016 is when my mentor left to pursue this. And 2017 is when I eventually left. Um, and I've been racking my brain on like what I want to do. And I actually left my job to start like an augmented like laser tag startup where you'd use computer vision and AI to do like uh, multiplayer augmented reality so you could like go play halo and like in retrofit a laser tag facility and make it like non 1980s technology and uh while i was working on that i was prototyping and doing all these various things um like in what felt like one week i'm sure it was longer um i, I kept getting uh really you know kind of terrible news from friends and family and colleagues and you know old ski buddies about folks getting hit uh by distracted drivers um, specifically while they're riding uh, their bikes to and from work. Um, and so that just like, kept happening. I was like, holy cow. And I was really excited about the augmented reality thing. But, um, you know, this, this terrible news, I was like, it kind of feels like I'm working on the wrong thing. <laughs> um, and so I, I shifted completely. I was already doing like embedded AI. And that's, that's what I realized was, okay, I missed this whole, um, I, I missed this whole wave of like big data cloud AI. Uh, but it seemed like embedded AI was still really hard. Um, and so uh, I had already focused on embedded AI. I learned so much about, you know, we're breaking records as a society in terms of like uh, image recognition, object detection, all those things like passing human level perception. Um, and so I, was, I really became obsessed with trying to figure out, could you make a device that, that could tell that you're going to get run over, right? Like that a, a car is on your tra trajectory. And I talked to a whole bunch of people. I got to talk to the CTO of Waymo, which was super fun. Um, and, you know, all the computer vision experts were like, duh, <laughs> like, of course you can. Um, you know, that's what autonomous driving is all about. And they're like, but you might have some like power concerns and like cost concerns, but, you know, very doable. Uh, and then everyone else was like, there's no freaking way. Like, there's no way that you'd be able to figure out um, if a car is like on a trajectory to, to kill you, to like hit you by a couple inches, which will kill you. One of the guys died who's hit by just a mirror and that's all it took, right? Just by hit by a couple inches. There's no way you'd be able to differentiate that. And, and I was kind of somewhere in between. Being an electrical engineer, had spent like a year and change getting into computer vision, deep learning, AI. Um, so I didn't know, right? These computer expert, experts said yes. Um, everyone else was like, absolutely no. So I, I prototyped it and uh, using like an Intel D435 neural computes uh, neural compute stick and a Raspberry Pi is horrible data path, incredibly inefficient, um, but it worked really well. So it was only three frames per second, but you could tell it like 20 feet if a car was going to miss you by a couple inches or hit you by a couple inches. And that's what made me realize like, wow, like the combination of depth perception in AI is like insanely powerful. Like I don't fancy myself an amazing programmer or anything. So that's not the point of this, but 
I, it only took me like two hours of coding once I like hacked it all together to like get that system because you can tell it's a car and then you can use the depth data to find the edge of the car. Uh, and then you can very easily like uh, project the trajectory, right? And, and cars don't move super abruptly. They, they tend to move in uh, you know, given lines or arcs. Uh, so I pr prototyped that, went to productize, and that's when I kind of like hit a dead end and found this really interesting situation. Typically in engineering, you can like solve the problem. It's just like a, a lot of hard work or like physics makes it impossible. And this was the first time in my career that it was like somewhere in between because like the chip existed that literally took that like Intel D435 and like the neural compute stick and like the Raspberry Pi effectively and put them all into like one chip. So it had the depth, it had the AI, it had like feature tracking, it had motion estimation, all those things. But there was, I couldn't find a way to use it to do any of those things. You know, it was just like a neural compute stick. So if you had like a computer on the bike, you know, you could like then add a camera and stuff. Um, but you couldn't take advantage of the depth processing or the feature tracking or any of those things. Um, and so that's when it, we had a decision to make. It, it was a team at that point uh, to either just give up on this like bike safety mission or to, you know, take that chip and build the platform. Uh, and so taking that chip and building the platform is what started the OpenCV AI kit. Uh, and Dr. Malik, you know, reached out pretty early on in the process when he saw what we were building, we were open sourcing everything. He was like, hey, you know, would you want to make this like a, a core part of OpenCV? And we're like, well, absolutely. That'd be huge. Um, you'd love to do that. And then the rest of it is, is then executing on the platform, uh, building, building Oak. That's amazing. That's amazing. I mean, it starts with a great why of mm -hmm. getting into it. Um, so that's when you start uh, Luxonis. Where's the name come from? Oh yeah, so uh, being a classic nerd, um, <laughs> I, I, I needed to come up with a, a company name and machine learning and all this stuff is all about a light, light and sound, right? Like natural language processing and sound, um, you know, and then, you know, lights, wh whether you're doing computer vision or LIDAR or whatever, it's all, it's all about light. Um, so Lux is the Latin word for light and uh, Sonus is the, uh, the plural, at least from my Googling, of, um, of sound in Latin. And so I just like was permuting on combinations of those that weren't already like taken, right? Like Sonos was clearly already taken. There's like a million Lux names. Uh, so I've like since found out. So like just jamming them together was Luxonis, uh, which no one knows how to pronounce. So it's retrospectively a really bad idea. Um, but, but that's where the name came from. That's great. That's great. And the domain was available. So it's a, it's a double win. Yeah, yeah. So we could get the Twitter and, and we could get, get Facebook for what it's worth and, and the domain and all that. Yeah. So now you're making devices that uh, allow embedded spatial AI to flourish. Um, yep. But there's sort of this open question, like, uh, what is spatial AI? Of course, it's like, you know, inference of space, but like, why does yep. that matter? What types of problems is it best for? Um, yep. And why is it so important to make the accessible in an embedded sense? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So to start out with, like, like who doesn't need spatial AI is like for a lot of like just security camera uh, purposes and a lot of like basic AI applications. Like you don't need spatial AI, right? Like you just want to know like is there someone on your front porch? Like is it someone who's like I know? Or are they stealing a package? That sort of thing. You don't need spatial AI. But in a lot of robotics robotics applications, you're like lured in by this like cool like YOLO like it knows what what people are and like where they are in pixel space but then you go to put it on a robot and you're like well it's kind of useless <laughs> right like <laughs> I wanted to know like how far away they were and you can kind of estimate it but you like put your arms based on the bounding box side you put your arms out wide and then the estimates like way off or the short person the tall person um and so it, it's so attractive but you go to build a robotic system something that real time interacts with the world uh, real time perceives the physical world so you need to know measurements you need to know distances uh, you want to have like a robot follow you or, or some other autonomy or you want to know the size of fish and the species of fish all those things having spatial information is so key um, so it's anything that, that has to uh, measure the world and, and create like structured data about the world where uh, the physical aspect matters um, so that's where that's what spatial ai is um, and that's what uh, we we saw was lacking in a specific niche which is actually like embedding this into some small product so uh, like the Intel solutions, like the D435, D455, uh, combined with like a computer and and then like some neural processing, like a GPU, uh, you can solve that problem if you have like a lot of space and money, um, but embedding it into a small product, like the, the bike product we were trying to make, like a you know, smart bike light, if you will, was not possible because you can't like right. grab your like a 1080 Ti and, and strap it to your bike seat with like <laughs> right. an Intel computer, like that gets 
you could actually probably, it just gets really painful, you know, you can't build products. So that uh, what, what we're aiming to allow and, and is just because we were trying to solve the problem, we didn't have the platform is, is getting that spatial AI capability that, that you can build with a D435 and a computer and a GPU and making it so you can embed that into something tiny uh, and then and make it modular so you can, you can actually build your, your own products. So it's you know, all built into this around the Mary Dex. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that makes a ton of sense. So space, when you need to measure, you need a sense of depth, uh, your, your bicycle application is a great example of yep. knowing how far from the car am I getting to and these sorts of things. I mean, if you think about it, if you had to guess, like what percent of problems are enriched, like computer vision problems that we're aware of today are enriched with a sense of depth versus those that yep. is it like an 80, 20 split? Is it 50, 50? Yeah, it, that's, that's a great question. And, and that's part of like, what we didn't know, especially before the Kickstarter, right, is is clearly we found a problem where you absolutely need depth information. And autonomous driving is another one, right? Like that's, it's all figuring out the, de the depth information that causes a lot of issues to using radar. When is radar blind? When is it giving false positives? Combining that with computer vision. Um, and so, so we, we don't know, right? A lot of incumbent uses of uh, computer vision don't require depth because you couldn't right. really do it. Right. Um, and so, so that's like part of like the innovator's dilemma, like the trap, right? Is you look at it and like a uh, analyst in a big company looks at it and is like, well, it's 99 or hundred percent of the market doesn't need that. Right. Because there was no way to leverage it before you couldn't embed it into products. And so I think we're about to find out. Um, so I can't, I can't honestly answer the question, but uh, from the folks who reached out to us, cause we tried to be as open and open source as possible. Cause we don't know how this is it, this, yeah. like we don't know a lot of these industries like commercial fishing, um, all these things I, I couldn't really think of, but I think it's huge. I think there's all sorts of applications that, um, that are impossible to foresee, but once you have this easy to use kind of abstraction layer that gives you these spatial AI, result, AI results, it seems like there's, it seems like it's, it's going to be a lot. There's still going to be a lot that don't need uh, sure. spatial information. And hence that's like the Oak one that doesn't have any spatial information, but yeah, I, I, sorry, I can't answer, but I have no idea. No, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's a funny, um, hard to prove question. I think the we'll see is yeah. a good way to put it. I mean, even when yeah. we started RoboFlow to allow anyone to build like their custom detectors, there's just, I mean, the thousands of developers that show up and make things that we just never would have anticipated. It's funny yeah, you bring yeah, up exactly. fish measuring because we've seen a bunch yeah. of like, people yeah. counting fish. So for example, yeah. there's someone that's in a county just outside of Seattle. And they installed a lot of new dams. And when you do that, you need a place for the salmon to still get around. So I don't know if right. you've seen this, but they install fish ladders, which was a new concept to me. But it's like these almost like looks like a pedestrian crosswalk, but there's like the net blocks yeah. of the salmon can swim up. Well, yeah. when they install these dams, they need to keep track of like how many salmon are affected. Are they still swimming upstream? So there's these right. windows and someone sits there and counts the salmon yeah. as they go past yeah. the windows in these fish ladders. And so someone yep. said RoboFlow built a custom detector and is now like counting fish to keep track of environmental populations, but they would right. benefit from the spatial information of how big are those fish, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. Detect, are the little ones not making it, for example, because they probably have statistical data on like the size of fish and like who would be going up. And, and so like, it could be the dams built wrong or the ladders built wrong for small fish or, or something or some subspecies of salmon. And, and that's the exact application we saw with fishing, which is like, we need to know what are like certain species of fish, but we also need to know uh, so in commercial fishing, it's really important if um, if you catch the wrong species, like you have to throw the whole catch back if there's too much. And that's huge, huge problem because you killed all the fish already and then you throw them all back. And then if it's too small, so if the distribution is too small, then you also have to throw the, right. the, that catch back. So it's really important to get that spatial information. Uh, and those are problems just that were unsolvable before, unless you could like, you know, Put, put a bunch of people underwater looking at fish with no boards, right? Like. Right, right, yeah. So yeah, you mentioned the Kickstarter earlier. I'd love to talk a little bit about that. So you were super generous and able to fulfill our order. I have an Oak One. And of course, this isn't how it's gonna look in final form because you've been crossing goals like crazy. And one of your new goals is to wrap this guy in aluminum. But let me get this close yeah. to you. I mean, just as you said, it's, it's smaller than the heat of my home. The most of the depth space that's taken up is just the cooling board to allow the- yep. uh, coils to cool more successfully, but the actual circuitry on this thing is, is super small. So I mean, what came in the box was this guy and this, and we'll put a link in the description of this video of how to train your own custom model on top of this, thanks, thanks to what's going on. Uh, but I'd love to hear, I mean, you're riding this huge wave where your campaign was fulfilled in 20 minutes, you've just crossed 5,000 backers, you've crossed a million in commits. I mean, are you worried? Like, are, are you going to be able to fulfill all these orders? Like, what? Like, what, yeah. How are you feeling at this time? What's what's your what's the pulse? How's the team doing? 
Yeah, so to kind of pull the curtain back a little bit, I mean, we're really excited. Um, our actual goal is 1.2 million. <laughs> so on Kickstarter, so like for, for those, like, I'm kind of like spoiling Kickstarter for the world, but it's like uh, the psychology, the psychological effect is huge. And, and everyone does this in their campaigns. They set, you know, unrealistically small goals because they're going to build it anyways. We're going to build it anyway. So our actual goal is 1.2 million. Uh, so, so we're very prepared to execute on delivery. We've in fact ordered a bunch of materials already b before we fund because this is something we're building anyways. Um, the, there were two things that, that really we wanted to, uh, to, to get out of Kickstarter. And, and I think you know, we've, done, we've done an excellent job executing on one and, and we've, we've learned a lot to improve on the second. Um, the main was to de-risk like, you know, I clearly think this matters. <laughs> Those working on the team and OpenCV thinks this matters, but a huge risk in the startup unless you're doing nuclear fusion or something that's like pushing the boundaries of physics is just, you're building something that no one cares about, right? Um, and so we wanted to just see, do people, if we get this out and we try to get it out in a big way, do people care about this? Like, does this yeah. matter, right? Is this useful to other people? Because, you know, clearly as an entrepreneur, you can convince yourself, you know, seven ways a Sunday that, that it matters and it doesn't, right? That's a huge business risk for startups. And then the second one was um, to just get it out in front of a lot of people in, in, allow this uh, kind of democratic discovery of, um, or like free market discovery, if you will, of all these applications of, of people who are, you know, the experts in their domain um, that know a ton about commercial fishing or some industry I know nothing about. They're like, yes, finally, like I can solve this problem. I was hoping that you'd be able to solve this problem. And so the 5,000 backers is what we're most excited about is, you know, that's potentially 5,000 different applications of, of really cool things that were impossible before. And one of the neatest ones has come out of it. And we have huge, huge response in this spatial AI competition we did through with OpenCV, the OpenCV spatial AI competition. And, and then also in the Kickstarter itself is uh, blind assistance tech. Uh, so you can map uh, using AI, spatial AI, where it clearly knows what objects are and where they are and distances and all that and map that into like audio waves. So you can uh, allow a person to visualize what's around them real time. And you know, the potential out of that is uh, people being able to play basketball, or like people who are fully blind being able to play basketball. Like that, that is potentially within reach within a couple of years. Um, so those, those are the things that we're most excited about. In terms of delivery, yeah, we're, we're actually not quite at our goal. <laughs> you know, our goal is, is 1.2 million. That's been our internal goal the whole time. But since we were gonna do it anyways, we set the, the public goal as at $20,000 because Actually, we picked that number because it's OpenCV's 20th anniversary. So we're just trying to figure out what, what number are we going to pick. And so yeah, twenty thousand dollars is the 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 Kickstarter goal. That's awesome. Yeah, I I mean I uh, with forty eight hours to go, I hope you can close that additional two hundred thousand of the internal goal. But this thing has been a lot yeah. of success. Like well, it's thanks. unbelievable thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, what you're what you're working on. And so one of the reasons that um, you and I are like even interested in continuing to to work together, sort of partner, is like the what else is needed in the ecosystem? So, I mean, right. your devices do a great job of handling the on-device spatial AI in a really accessible way. I mean, you're selling this guy for, I think it's 150 in the Kickstarter. Uh, so that one's the, the campaign, campaign price is 99. Um, and yeah, the, like our backer kit. So we're revealing that a bit early. So, so folks who didn't back the campaign, but still on a good deal, will be able to get it for, for 150, and then the the MSRP is is 199. So if, if, if folks miss out, so yeah. The, the point is like an accessible price. Like have, and this is yep. 4K camera quality doing yep. real time detection. We put Yolo V3 Tiny on this, get 15 frames per. It's amazing what you're doing to democratize access. So I mean, um, what else is needed in the ecosystem to make this make this to life? To allow like you know. So recreating the world to a, actually someone that doesn't have sight is a pretty good thing. Like, is, is, yeah. is a pretty good heuristic, I should say, for realizing yep. all of the tasks that we need to make possible. So like, how do you get there? There's so many niche things that we see in our everyday life. What in the ecosystem is also needed? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. And, and that's, you know, a, a lot of why we're so excited about RoboFlow is um, there are so many other pieces to this, right? So, you know, we, our whole mission is to abstract this embedded spatial AI. So you can have a tiny thing doing performant machine learning, right? Uh, but then there's, there is the, the whole other side of how do you train that? How do you make a model for, you know, counting fish that, that does it accurately and has confidence and is properly, uh, you know, weighted against various classes and all those sorts of things. And those are hard problems to solve. Uh, and, and that's core to the reason that we uh, open source as much as we can 
is then it allows uh, folks folks who you know know more than us about some problem or uh, or have this excellent training platform that, that performs this kind of like corollary of the abstraction but for making amazing neural models amazing to generate well balanced neural models um, they can tie in directly without having to like request things from us right so it's so an example of that is um, we were planning on doing um, uh, semantic segmentation with BPLAB example like we were planning on writing that and one of the customers reached out and was like, hey, like, you know, I'm using semantic segmentation with your thing and I'm running into this, like this one little issue. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, like, right, you are, right? Uh, and it's because, you know, we made the, we haven't written the example, but since it's open source, you just took some examples from us, some examples from an engineer, uh, Katsuya Hyodo in Japan, um, and like combined them together and had semantic segmentation running. Um, so, so our mission, there's, there's so many other pieces and our mission is to make it so, so they can all fit together with, without us being the bottleneck, right? Uh, and, and RoboFlow, I think, is a, a key part of that in that making awesome models and, and what you guys have built to then allow it to flow down to our device and, and performantly run and, and take advantage of, of all the abstraction that you guys have there. I think something that's like really unified in our visions for how this happens is interoperability. Whether that's open right. source that someone could take and work, but for us, it's like, yeah, yep. your preferred labeling service. Maybe you like to use C that. Maybe you like to yep. use bot, you use label image, you use label box, you use scale, you use M yes. all there's 36 different annotation formats alone that we support today, right. You're adding one a week. How do you get that centralized? Yep. And then and then the things that you abstract with with your devices, yep. it just like it just runs, right? Like I, yep, I, right. I export them on yep. a right format, I go through the commands, go to open Vino. I put it on here and immediately I have, a, I guess not this one, but I put on an OD and I have spatial yep. by default. It's just, it's, it's amazing. And so I think the, the visions for how to make this come to life are, are, are unified. And by the way, like kind of like a good fight against the big guys in the space in a lot of ways of like <laughs> yeah. this groundswell of like everyday developers who yep. um, can get started it makes it accessible. Like computer vision isn't just for the Google Teslas of the world. It's like any developer right. that wants to help a, you know, count fish or yep. identify writing targeted soccer lessons or yep. improving manufacturing processes. It's, it's awesome. And so yeah. I deeply respect the type of work that you're doing. Yeah. Like the interoperability and being able to democratize it is huge. And that's the lesson that's learned over and over again on um, disruptive technologies is that big companies, extremely well-run big companies are bad at disruptive technologies because you know they have to keep the lights on and they have huge budgets right and they've got huge spins on personnel um, and it's so it's usually typically the smaller companies that actually allow the disruptive markets right because it's those markets that no one really knows about yet no one knows that that's going to be you know a hundred billion dollar market right now it's like a thousand dollar market and a guy in a garage right so it's all about yeah. that accessibility I mean, your, your kickstarter net a million in the span of the duration of the campaign google adwords will do that in you know an hour right like it doesn't, right. it's not going to move yeah. it's not going to move the needle for them but the crazy yes. thing is the ground spell is like yep. it's yeah I, I totally get it as a startup founder very much aligned with like that's how you do it <laughs> faster yeah um, that's awesome. So, I mean, the, I suppose, uh, the ask that you have is like, be sure people check out the campaign, but even yep. after the campaign, when people discover this video afterwards, what would you instill in the audience? Yeah, it's, I mean, there's, there's so many, uh, I, Dr. Malik put this really well. It's like AI is like electricity, right? Like it can be used to, to do so many things. So like, I'm just plagiarizing what he said or whatever the verbal form of plagiarizing is. Um, which is like, you know, when electricity was first used, it was like, cool, lights. Oh, all right. You know, and then folks started discovering, like, you could use it for other things, right? So uh, exploring your space, and there's so much market exploration that uh, I think it was Forbes talked about, if um, you shut down AI research, like everyone just stopped, and the forefront didn't move at all, there'd be a decade of billion dollars a year of market exploration of just saying, like, okay, like this thing exists, what is it now useful for, right? And that market exploration is some expert in their field, uh, again, that I've probably never heard of, that, that has a problem and doesn't know it's solvable. Um, so I guess the thing I would say is like, you know, what, what problems can you now, now solve? Because this, this allows you to, to do human-like perception uh, in a myopic way. So if it's like farming and you're, you're um, picking strawberries, you know, you can get as good or better than a human at picking strawberries. Like you can estimate ripeness and quantify it, or you're like, trying to figure out good onion versus bad onion, 
there's all sorts of problems that just literally aren't solvable by a human because you can't cram a human into something this big, right? Hey. And so you just couldn't solve it before. Uh, so that would be my ask is, you know, think about, think about how we can make the world more efficient and we can, we can use this to like do good and, you know, produce fruits better, um, you know, have uh, less of a negative impact on, you know, species in the oceans or species anywhere or do, uh, you know, or, organic farming that's, that's more efficient because you can just zap the bugs with lasers, right, instead of using chemicals. Uh, think about in your industry and your expertise, you know, what, what problems can be solved because that's, that's not something that, you know, corporate projections, it's not something that you can really like think through at a top level down it's more so like these, all these experts that have worked so hard in their industries, they know those things and, and hopefully we can get this out and put it in front of them and then they can say, holy cow, this is, this is something I can actually do now, right? Like, and it, it feels like science fiction. Like a lot of the things, especially when we start on these projects, you're like, are we really going to pull this off? Like the projects we've done directly. And then it's like flying on a UAV and you're like, yeah, it's just like totally works, right? Uh, and it's the same thing like picking strawberries. So a student here uh, used, used one of these. Um, he actually ended up using, we have other variants. So like we've got a variable baseline. So you can like, if you want to see super far, super short, and you can hack it together in your prototype without making a custom board. And, you know, he wanted to pick strawberries. Um, and I was like, well, like that should be doable, right? And like in a weekend, he had a prototype running like picking strawberries. And they're like, well, clearly that's super doable. Um, so yeah, that would be my ask. Do that's, that discovery, figure out what's awesome. next. That's really motivating. Yeah, I mean, the, the technologists might provide the foundations, but the domain experts bring it to life. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Can't can't wait to see uh, what people build on top of uh, Pope. And congrats again on all the Kickstarter success. It's clearly just getting started. And thanks so much thanks. for your time. Yeah, absolutely.